The following may contain offensive language, adult humor, and or content that some viewers may find offensive. The views and opinions expressed by any one speaker does not explicitly or necessarily reflect or represent those of Mark Rattledge or W2M Network. Please listen with caution, or don't listen at all. TV party tonight! Oh, TV party tonight! Oh, we got nothing better to do than watch TV and have a couple of brews. Don't want to talk about anything else. We don't want to know. We're dedicated yes. to our favorite shows. Oh, my tickets! Everybody loves hip photo! Scary dog! Dancing at Blurred Ball! Futurama! Good evening. You are listening to a Rad Religion Broadcasting Premier Podcast TV party tonight. I'm your host, the mandated reporter, and frankly, I'm mortified, Mr. Mark Radledge. And tonight, we continue our journey from the corner to the deuce. We are headed down to the Treme, where the people sashay. Treme was brought to you by the good people at Blown Deadline Productions, HBO Entertainment, uh, season, we we're talking seasons three and seasons four tonight. Uh, season three aired from September 23rd, 2012 to November 25th, 2012. And then season four began on a little more than a year later, December 1st, 2013 and ended December 29th, 2013. And you might be asking yourself, is this my beautiful house? Is this my beautiful wife? You might also be asking yourself five episodes. What the hell happened? Jesse Starcher, what happened to the to the second half of Treme season four that we decided that we had to do all 15 episodes, one and a half seasons in this one podcast, Jesse Starcher of the Screaming Boy podcast? Yeah, man. I can't believe it. We, we Something had to have occurred, right? You know, you're, you're looking at an HBO show. I don't know. I've never seen them do this very often mm -hmm. where they have said, hey, we're cutting it off in the middle of things <laughs> most most of the time now granted i say middle of things it, it doesn't mean that you know they leave us on a cliffhanger or anything like right. that but it they definitely uh talked to them and said look we don't have it there isn't enough to continue with this show well, um but you you have you have some insight there if i, I do right. before we before we get to the article and before we get to kind of like the rationale behind all of this it is an interesting thing to think about the times that you know, there's an entire podcast dedicated to seasons seasons of television that were canceled after one ep after one season or right. one episode even like canceled at the pilot. Um, they they have a very loose definition of season of television, and <laughs> so I remember like the Glades, for example. The Glades ended with the sheriff, I believe, being shot, and they intended to come back for another season and conclude the story and reveal the mystery shooter, and it got canceled. No, no one knows who's the mystery. No one knows who shot the sheriff. Oh, geez. they didn't shoot the deputy. Just That's know that. Good. That's yes. good. <laughs> or or the, <laughs> or the coroner or whatever the fuck used to go around with him on that show. Um, what other like seasons of television just abruptly ended and there was no resolution? They just got canceled and they never like. I know vinyl got canceled after one season, but that season of television seemed to have been resolved and they just never came back for a second season. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a small you. handful. Yeah, I was gonna say off the top of your head, can you think of can you think of any no. where it's like what the hell happened? Like, it, like we never we never resolved this issue. No, it's I think that what takes me by surprise here is the fact mm -hmm. that you know they had enough to go in and do just enough to wrap things up. But yeah, yeah. I mean, there's plenty of there's plenty of just like you said, there's plenty of stuff where. Uh, shows will get canceled after one season or mm -hmm. uh, it, but it's rare that it happens in the middle of in the middle of a story uh right. there are man i can't think of any boy i i know that there's a couple standouts out there think, though that did, didn't homicide kind of end with like a cliffhanger and then they had to do the movie to resolve it they did the movie yeah they did the movie to resolve it but that was movie, purposeful the they weren't like you're not coming like like they knew they weren't coming back so they wrote right. to that cliffhanger ending and then did the movie Exactly. If I remember correctly. Um, so let's, if you're not, if, unless you want to talk a little bit more about this, the ratings, and this is, play, is this going to play into 
our discussion this first little bit before we get into the characters. The very first season of Treme, episode one, uh, U.S. viewers per episode in thousands, uh, eleven, um, one thousand one hundred and thirty. Right? It's never okay. going to get that high again. Oh, the, cl- the closest it comes is nine hundred and thirty-one, and that is for the season one finale, episode ten. Season two, the first episode, the premiere, is six oh five. The uh, penultimate, I think it's the word. Uh, the second to last, second to last, yeah, episode is seven twenty one, and then the finale is episode eleven, the longest of any of the four seasons, uh, is six hundred and sixty four. We're down to five sixty eight when we get to season three, and by the time it's done, it hits a high of six hundred two uh, at episode five, and then after that, it kind of goes off a cliff, and it ends at four seventy three. By the time we get to the season four. We our season finale is is half of what it was season one. I'm sorry, our season premiere. And when it's over, it's 397, and that might be the second lowest of any episode except for the one before it. The one before it was 348. It's so weird. Really stop caring about this show. Yeah, the thing is, is that HBO shows there isn't much to like draw you in in the middle of a season anyway. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like there's a lot of advertisement that I even recall. Well, I was going to say, can you show. imagine you picked up The Wire midway through? <laughs> yeah, I dude. think I told you, like, I started watching, like, who are all these black guys? You know, and, and I had to watch <laughs> from the beginning because they might as well have been speaking Mandarin fucking Chinese. I had no clue what was going on. And I started all over again. Right. Like, can you, like right. even any, but I, I would say, like, most, most story driven, chaptered, structured television shows. You can't watch in the middle. Right. You have to start at the beginning. Right. You have to start at the beginning. And I mean, if you miss the boat on the beginning of Treme, really, this show is sort of like a show that you can probably feel comfortable enough with kind of mm-hmm. hopping in in the middle of. It's not like you're missing a extremely large plot line that you can't figure out by watching one show. Yeah, no, but know? well, I don't know. I don't know how much I agree with that. There's a lot of detail in this show. But that's David uh, Simon I mean, for you. His shows are thick, thick Jesse. Okay. His shows are juice, thick, juicy, juicy. and vascular. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> as far as far as David Simon shows go, I would say this is one mm-hmm. that you could you'd feel you wouldn't feel too overwhelmed. We'll just put it that way. If you got dropped in the middle, you could tell Jeanette's having problems with her restaurant <laughs> yeah, pretty sure. easily. You could yeah. you could tell Davis is a crazy a, a, a mm-hmm. crazy guy out there, but. And, and granted, there are some overarching themes that, like the Indians and things like that, you may not know. Like I, I, I didn't even know that <laughs> was a thing at the Clark beginning. Clark Peters talking show. about being purdy. He was just like, is he a drag queen? Like, what does he mean? <laughs> well, yeah, what's going on <laughs> there? Um, <laughs> what's what's he selling? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So there's, you I, know, there's that that good bit. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> I was gonna say, Treme. If if you could, if you do some ratings analysis. I think people were interested, one, because it's a David Simon show, two, because it was about New Orleans in the wake of Katrina. People were interested. Katrina was a big deal. Katrina was a big deal nationwide. Mm. You know, people, people it was kind of like 9-11 in that this was, you know, this was a huge fucking hurricane that flooded this entire city. And then the fault, the, the way the federal government handled it was news in and of itself. You know, we did. did was it Ray Nagan's fault? Was it George Bush's fault? Was it, um, you know, whose fault was it that people didn't get the help that they needed on time? And then you hear like the horror stories about the Superdome and all of that. So people were interested. But when you, again, you look at, you do the ratings analysis and you look and you see that the the ninth episode had 1,165 and then, and then the 10th episode, 931. But I mean, it dropped down mid-season. Uh, episode five is five seventy-two, seven is five sixty-five, forty-one is eight. Like <clears throat> people were losing interest in this show pretty fast, and then it never gets as it. It's never as good as that first season. The so, war, the more this war on, the less people got interested in it. Give me what were the uh, what was the first year that this season one aired? Season one aired twenty ten. Okay, so let me tell you what happens the following year 
at HBO. Mm -hmm. That's Game of Thrones. Mm. So, uh, you know, you got to think about what's on HBO at that point in time as well. That might be pulling some of the viewers. Now, granted, you could hop on there and watch Treme. And is Treme a water cooler show? <laughs> I mean, I, I was going to say, like, can, can we because we are taking a trip, you and I, through the periwinkles from the corner to the deuce hand in hand we as we go over the pronunciation bridge. Did I get all of our gimmicks in there? <laughs> <That's okay>. um, <laughs> <laughs> but you and I, hand in hand, lovers as we are walking from the corner to the deuce, I think the question has to be asked, of all the David Simon stuff that he David Simons, how niche is this show? Niche. Super niche, right? I say it's very niche. Very. So once, very. like, so 2010, we are five years past Katrina. By the time the show ends, we're, what, eight years? Yeah. Away from Katrina. And... Here's the thing. After season one, and you and I talked about this with season two, after season one, Katrina is not that big of a deal anymore. People have, by the time season two starts, people are mostly back to normal again. I mean, everyone's kind of mm. dealing with the trauma of it and the fallout. Like, don't get me wrong. Right. Like, it, it's, it's affecting them, but we're talking like we're dealing in the shadow of Katrina. We're not dealing with Katrina. Season one was the compelling thing about season one was we were dealing with the fallout of Katrina three months after. You know, things are not functioning. People are trying to figure out, you know, people are trying to figure out how to keep the lights on and put bread on the Every, you know, houses are flooded, covered in mold. You know, the city is essentially been bombed. You know, I when the hurricane la uh, last year, I think, hit Fort Myers, Fort Myers looked like it had been carpet bombed. Like, yeah. Iraq. yeah. And mm -hmm. that's how Katrina looks. Uh, that's how New Orleans looked. And so it's it's kind of like here is the city, this very unique city in, in in all of the world, but especially the United States, with this culture, with this music, with you know, with everything. And now, and okay, so how does this culture, how does the city survive in the wake of a giant fuck all flood? Yeah, and that's interesting. That maybe got people talking in season one, but I think once people got the gist of what Treme was. You know, and it's just like it almost again, like they're speaking Mandarin Chinese at times. Like, like you gonna get on that second line? The fuck are you talking about? <laughs> you know, they're talking like jazz. Anytime Steve Zahn talked when he just wasn't being silly and he was talking about like musical traditions, might as well have been another language. Yep. Yeah. And so, very, you know, go ahead. I was just gonna say he, he's very educated about what's going on down there, mm -hmm. and he knows the ins and outs of the area and the ins and outs of the culture and right. and the history. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of what's coming out of his mouth, unless uh, how many of those bands that he rattled off, or how many of those people mm -hmm. had you ever heard of? Yeah, I mean, Fats Domino. Fats Domino <laughs> was in the yes. He Fats showed Domino, up. I was that's like, it, it's man. Fats. Like, <laughs> and like, I know Doctor John. And I, and I, okay. like, I like, you know, look on my kids. I couldn't tell you a Dr. John song, but I've worked in music. I've been in music. I know Dr. John. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's that. And then so getting into season three, I just sort of close out this discussion. I why, you know, they got a full season out of season three and they continued everyone's story. And I sometimes wonder if one season of Treme would have cut it. You know, we had the idea. We got it down. Like, I, I, I wonder if some shows are just not meant to be an ongoing thing. Like, it should have been a, almost like a mini series, or like an event series. I agree. I will agree with you. Because think... season two just felt like, well, we'll continue to follow the lives of these people. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you're interested in those people. Sure. It's great. You know, if you're not interested in these people, there's not a compelling through thread. I mean, we talked about that, you know, like you struggled with like the reform the law um you know the construction and reform and all of that like all like the politics of new orleans you're like fuck this right. show you know <laughs> and then there's like the the criminal element we talked about that in season two and again it, it, it kind of you just i can just imagine people kind of looking at each other going all right it's more of the wire but less interesting <laughs> like i love right. this show but you have to be like a jazz enthusiast you have to be like a music enthusiast serious really seriously. get into tremendous and, yeah. and I'm just gonna uh, let you say it. I'm gonna let you. I'm gonna. I'm gonna pitch. I'm gonna pitch you a softball, Jesse. I want you to just nail it out of the fucking park. Okay. Much like Luke Cage. Luke Cage, baby. How many fucking? How like stuffed and artificially inflated 
is this show with just concerts. Yeah, man. I, I'm telling you, I did the same thing this these two seasons as I did last season. Music was playing. I fast forward. <laughs> I was going every 10 seconds and just, okay, is the song over? Great. Now let's get back mm-hmm. to the story. So, yeah, I mean, if you appreciate music in your television shows, live music, ladies mm-hmm. and gentlemen, let me just tell you, there's live music down in New Orleans, Louisiana, <laughs> just in case yeah, you I don't didn't know if people know, know that or not. <laughs> but, but if you walk down Bourbon Street, you might catch a live band or two. There might be a band on the corner playing something or That's even right. in a club. I mean, and it's like, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. And, and and some of the music I did notice definitely kind of paired with kind of what the person was going through. But right. again, sometimes it's just like, I, I didn't care. I, that yeah. is going to lose some people. If people right. are impatient, I think that's a key. You mm-hmm. have to be patient with this show. Yes, you do. Mm-hmm. And I told you, like my first run through of this, I watched it as a completist. My second run through, I was more emotionally attached to it, but I think it's because I, I fell in love with New Orleans in the intervening years. I have an article yeah. here. So I, we're going to talk about like season three got a full 10 episodes. Season four only got a half a season. Um, that's why we're doing both. Uh, that's why we're doing both this episode before we move on to, I believe the next one is Show Me a Hero. And this is from Vulture. And I kind of just want to read this to you and talk about it for a minute. And then we can get into characters. Sights on Treme's fourth season, a farewell and benediction. The New Orleans drama Treme is a demanding in some ways off-putting show. Just feel free to react at any time. <laughs> <laughs> I can see this is an off-putting show. Jesse is like, you goddamn skippy. <laughs> it can be at times. I was yeah. invested in some characters. I enjoyed mm-hmm. myself for the most sure. part. So. Um, yet at the same time, a warm and sweet one. The paradoxical mix of qualities is on display in the show's final half season of five episodes premiering on HBO tonight. And this was written several years ago. It's still, it's still the sort of show that makes you reach out to it rather than reaching out to you. A characteristic that Treme shares a good many of its characters, a mostly obsessive and intractable bunch who are inclined to monologues about artwork, family mortality, and the characteristics of the perfect po' boy. But the show's palpable sense of community, coupled with its awareness of how individuals struggle through trauma and grief, warms everything up. Treme wasn't a here's the here's the rub. Treme wasn't a big enough hit for HBO to order a full fourth season, from everything I've heard, says the writer. This book ending half season wasn't easy for the producers to get, yet there's no bitterness or rancor in these episodes, no sense of score settling. It's got the feeling of a farewell and benediction. Its heart is kind. I won't divulge too many plot developments here because I'm planning on taking Simon's advice to watch a thing in totality and write about it at, at length later on. And because the plot was never, <laughs> and because plot was never Treme's main area of interest anyway. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Ooh. Suffice to say, what's especially striking here is how much mellower the characters are when we first laid eyes on them. In the first season, which took place in the immediate aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, almost everybody was hanging from a frayed thread. The many monologues sometimes rants about what was great or horrible about New Orleans seemed in retrospect like blasts of emotional steam being let off by people who weren't sure how they'd get through the next week. We talked about this, let alone the next year, who were legitimately worried about what would become of the city that defined so much of their identity. Um, and then this goes on and on and on. So, um, yeah, I, there, I, there's I your answer, Jesse. The most important part there is right at the beginning. Uh, like they said, it sounded like it was even tough for them to get these final yeah. five. Out, I, I, which... I'm almost wondering if they were told, like, you're canceled the third season. David Simon's like, but I'm a pretty girl. Yeah. I'm I'm a pretty girl. Well, and if you want me to do pretty things for you, if you want me to make you feel good, <laughs> then you got to let me finish. You know, let me tell, finish my story. Right. Right. You want more stories. You gotta let me finish this story. You can't just give me story blue balls. And HBO's like, you have five fucking episodes, you psycho. Finish it. Finish! <laughs> Finish me off and let's get this over with. I gotta go to bed, is what HBO said. Is that what they I said? May be pro- I may be projecting a little. <laughs> um, I'm tired. Right. I'm tired. We're tired of it. I'm tired of it. Jesse Starcher, show me your dangling. Mm. Pictures. How about I, I show you our characters of the show? <laughs> we'll go there first. 
why we'll, every then we'll week see I, where the night takes us every week i ask you to show me your dangling in pictures and every week you're like what about pictures of characters like i don't understand <laughs> Oh man! All right, else, let me go ahead. Y'all shows me they're dingling whether I want them to or not. You know that? Uh, oh, oh no! Yeah, my they show goodness. me the trimming with the people sashay. Oh, that's my me. porch. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Look, we're going to start things off with. Let's just, if we're going to cry, let's get the crying out of the way right now. Woo <laughs> wee! Yeah, seasons three and four. The old big chief. Oh man. So Albert Lambro, we got his. I have some shit to say about Ladonna when you're ready. Oh, okay, all right. Well, yeah, I mean, we're starting off with Albert. I mean, in season three, as we had seen, uh, he, you know, he's going through the motions there for quite a while, and then finds out that I knew, I knew, in that first scene that he showed up and coughed. I was like, no he's going to end up with cancer. Yep. I had diverse B cell lymphoma twice. Twice mm. I beat cancer. This was hard to watch. Yeah, man. I I could only imagine, like, when you first watched this, mm -hmm. was it after you had it was uh, 2000, been diagnosed? What, what do I say it was? It was 2013. No, I didn't get cancer until 2017. So going around the second time, man, I mean, I'm sure it hit a lot different for you. Yeah, Jesse, I died on a podcast. Yes. Um, <laughs> oh, I was present, I was present for that. <laughs> <laughs> Straight up died on a podcast and then got back up. I was like, why'd you, why'd you kick me off the podcast? Why, 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 why'd you hang up? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Like, you were just, well, you were it just sounded dead. like your wife, your wife was about to call the ambulance. All right. It was that close. And I was like. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to this man suffer anymore. <laughs> Gosh, it was horrible. You uh, you kicked me off a podcast in a dream. You better wake up and apologize. <laughs> I told you I will podcast from my fucking grave. Yes, he will. I'm yes. done when I say we're done. He is not joking <clears throat> around. I have a lot of big chief in me, don't I? Mm, I can see that, yeah. You're stubborn, strong-willed man, <clears throat> sir. That's um, for sure. Second time around watching this. Oh, first time, didn't have cancer. Second time, I'm a cancer survivor and I watched him and yeah, there were some traumatic moments for me um, watching Clark Peters play this guy going through cancer, uh, getting the chemotherapy, you know, the coughing, the weakness. Uh, when you see him later on in season four and he, he, uh, his cancer has a reoccurrence um, and he decides to not get treatment, which I considered at one point. Mm. I, 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 know, I know this time around, like I've had knock on wood, a clean bill of health. The last couple of go rounds, you know, I've had a clean bill of health since 2020, um, which is <laughs> which is not to say that I've been healthy. I'm just saying I haven't had cancer. Um, right. And I and I've often said I get cancer a third time. I don't know if I can go through chemo again. I very I very much readily identified with where Big Chief Lambeau was coming from, in that you've only got so many of these treatments in you, and after a while the cure starts to hurt just as much, if not more than the cancer itself and quality of life is a thing. And sometimes after a while, I just feel like you just, it just beats it out of you. You know, mm -hmm. the strongest amongst us eventually get tired and, you know, we're going down. Right. So, and, and I've, but I've also like, I identify with the family of like, don't give up. Why, you know, why we love you. Keep fighting. Um, and till you've done it, you know, it's easier said than done. So, like, I got where Delman was coming from. Um, but it, like I said, it was not easy to watch seasons three and four with these characters knowing how I know and how I felt. Right. Yeah. You, you know, Albert was this just a, a, a he's a you couldn't change him no matter what and mm -hmm. uh a lot of some of the fun interactions from this series is watching delmond try to mm -hmm. try to change or at least deal with albert well, what was funny was hearing him like i didn't want your sisters to know because i don't want to be fussed over right heard <laughs> been there yeah you know we we yep. were open we told people but 
when you tell someone you have cancer, their their treatment of you changes, and it's a very artificial, superficial change. It's very much like, oh, cancer is a bad thing, and I feel bad for you, so I'm nicer to you because I because I'm sad you have cancer. Yeah, I, I would rather you just continue to treat me like how you would normally treat me, and not treat me like a special case based on this thing that I didn't, you know. I've been doing a podcast since 2006. I've had, you know, two kids. Um, I've worked the same job for over a decade. I've had some pretty decent accomplishments in my life. But everyone likes to talk about me surviving cancer. And I've always struggled with that because it's like, that's not an accomplishment. I didn't do anything. I just survived. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I did, and independent of trying, I, I showed up. I, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe other people feel differently about this, but I always felt like, don't treat me like I accomplished anything. I just happened to not die. Well, but people act like can't like when you fight when you fight and beat cancer, you like wrote a you wrote a symphony, you know, or you benched well, five hundred pounds. Let's stop for a second though sure. and think about this because you just said you'd been in Big Chief's shoes where you were mm -hmm. like, I want to give up, and you didn't, and that's the key i mean that's the thing that's what everybody you know yeah you beat cancer not only i don't i guess it's not about beating cancer it's more about beating yourself and continuing I beat, on I beat myself quite quite frequently quite frankly <laughs> hey that was such a touching moment wasn't it <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it's, uh, anyway <laughs> It's it's all about, you know, the, the drive and the tenacity to continue mm -hmm. to live. And I think that is what people are. Hey, you've survived cancer, man. You should be extremely. Uh, I'm only going to agree with you in this sense, because I've talked about this with my wife before. And I've talked about this with some other people. And the answer I get is everyone. A lot of people just give up. They quit working. They they their life becomes about cancer treatments and doctor visits and hospital stays. And they stopped living their life. And I didn't. I screamed at you for kicking me off a podcast when I came back to life. That's the truth. <laughs> True story. Um, uh, and it's yeah. so funny because I had a witness. So it's not like, you know, it's not like I didn't have a witness there. Chris was right along with me. Like, I, I told him, I'm hanging this thing up, man. I never, I, I never stopped working either. Like, I remember that I second do. go around. You working, man. Yeah. During COVID. So during COVID with a mask on and a tumor in my lungs, the size of my fucking fist pressing on my heart to where I can only walk two or three steps without having to like stop and take deep breaths. And I still continued to work, pulled every muscle in my stomach, in my torso every day, just breathing. And I didn't Man. stop. Not a, not a day. Didn't call out sick unless I was in the hospital. And that, and, and you know, to tie this back in with the series. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what big chief was going. He was going to make right. that walk. I'm going to make, make that, that walk, walk. me. I'm right. gonna make that walk me. And he does he does it the one year. And of course, mm -hmm. unfortunately, he can't. He doesn't make it. Uh and by season four, the walk is happening and he is he knows. Yeah. Um and, and that's what I think a lot of what really hurt me watching this was watching Dell mm -hmm. have to reconcile with the fact that he's about to watch his father, this you know, this, this strong man that's been a force in his life for for Ooh, such a long all time he wanted was his approval yeah you know and I, I tell you this is one of the nicer arcs in the series how how delman came to his father because when you when you first meet delman he doesn't want to do the traditions he doesn't he wants he doesn't want to be his dad he wants to be his own man he's playing modern jazz he's in new york he's in paris new york. he's a man about the world and because of Katrina, because of his loyalty to his father, um, because his father, you know, tends to not want to have to deal with his sisters, he comes down and, you know, and, you know, we talked about this last season, just like, hey, you've been sewing? It's like, it's like, I'm trying. It's like, you ain't going to make that walk. You ain't going to sew. You ain't no Indian. <laughs> daddy, daddy, I'll sew. Oh, damn, daddy. You know, yeah, desperately, desperately crying for his, for his approval. And, it was a nice i like at the end of season four i like that you know as insistent as albert was that he wear the crown he was like i'm not gonna be here every year 
Yeah. And, you know, and in, the, and in the end, he's got one foot in New Orleans and one foot in New York. You know, he's trying to take what he learned from these few years with his dad, with who he is as a man, and form something new and move forward in that way. And it was really, really nice. It's like, if if nothing else, I think this is one of the better stories, the better arcs from start to finish, is mm -hmm. how Delman came to be both New York and New Orleans at the same time. I really like yeah. that. Yeah. That bitch, LaDonna, however. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before we before we move on to LaDonna yeah. here real quick, I just want to say that there are some great uh, subtle things that happen throughout the whole mm -hmm. series. They just like you said, they're brought back. Uh, Dell's brought to New Orleans to help his father rebuild. And by the end of the series, season four, uh, he's putting the finishing touches on the house. Uh, yeah. They got everything put together. Isn't that and great how like the house yeah. is a metaphor for the show? It really is. They they did that a couple times, mm -hmm. uh, especially with the way that they ended the the last yeah. shot, and we'll talk about that because I have that as one of my notes. But yeah, they did a great job with that. So, um, and and you know, hey, a, a lot of Albert or not Albert, I'm sorry, a lot of Dell's arc this se uh, season three is mm -hmm. him getting involved with the jazz hub and the culture uh, center there for New Orleans, and mm -hmm. then he ends up returning the consulting fee because of uh, they won't tear down a fence so kids right. can come over and his dad that made his dad proud of him and, and i think yeah. that was a great moment in this in the uh it ain't right ain't doing well. it del and i you know del learns a valuable lesson about like you know his father might be a stubborn mule but his father had principles yes he wasn't being stubborn for you know stubborn sake he you know it wasn't like a prejudice or like a racism kind of a thing um which often informs a lot of stubbornness mm -hmm. it was and then, and I've I kind of I don't know if struggle is the right word, but I'll, just for the sake of conversation, I'll say struggle. I struggle with you know the idea of it doesn't really matter if I benefit from this or not. We need to do what is just. We need to do what is right. Mm -hmm. And you often lose everyone around you because people just want to do what makes sense to them, what what benefits them, and I want to do what's right. And sometimes that doesn't benefit me in particular, but that's better than just doing what. What, that it's to do what's right and just is better than to do what benefits me, right? And not everyone agrees with that, so yeah. you end up looking like a stubborn ass half the time. But Del Delman starts to realize the value of that, the value of principles. Yeah. All right, what's your thoughts on L Miss Ladie Ladonna here? What, so what, you know what how, upsets you? This one may have hit me personally. Oh boy, Larry, mm. poor Larry. Poor Larry. He's just trying. He's tried. Larry has done everything for her. See, this sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Awkward silence ensues. <laughs> Larry did everything for LaDonna. Did everything for those boys. Moved his practice two or three times. Moved them to Baton Rouge. Moved them back to New Orleans. We're living with his brother got picked her up when she you know when she fell down after being like raped and beaten kept the bar open even though he fucking hated it quote unquote larry did everything for her larry earned loyalty and respect and gratitude and got nothing this know. bitch fell out of I love know. with him was faking it got tired of faking it and then decided that she wanted to be with Big Chief. And she fucking leaves him. There was a point in which I was like, are they writing this like, are they writing her to do this because they want... Because the women chemistry? are terrible? <laughs> I didn't know if they... I thought, well, they want the chemistry between a Big Chief and a LaDonna. They mm -hmm. probably... You know, I, I saw it immediately. Oh, yeah. As soon as Dude. they sat down across Sexual from each other. chemistry between Candy Alexander and Clark Peters? Arr, I was arr. like... But don't... Don't make her out like this where she just, like, straight yeah. up... He, she leaves Larry. And not only that, I mean, he continues to take care of her kids. Yeah. This motherfucker. This oh, sucker. Oh, my gosh. Like, and, and like, he, like, he loved those boys. And he was like... Right. 
I, I'm going to keep them because they have to be in school. They need structure. They need stability. And you're a nutcase, and you never know what you want to live or what you're doing, and I don't know what you're going to oh, do next. Best quote of the series mm -hmm. is Antoine referring, I think, Delmond to LaDonna about the Indians in practice, and he goes, right. well, she's up and down like Mercury. And I was like, yeah. That is exactly right. When, she okay. is. When Antoine and, and Larry are talking in season four, and and Larry goes, her never know what she wants, bipolar ass. Oh, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> Larry. Uh, let's, you and me should go bowling, Larry. <laughs> I get it. I identify, sir. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> I was like, mm. especially with what I'm going through now. I hear you, Larry. Loud and fucking clear. Jeez. I uh I love Candy Alexander, but LaDonna by the end of this is the villain of fucking Jermaine. <laughs> Ray Megan. Oh, <laughs> it's man. It's, that's how it goes for me. I love I love the moment where I mean clearly she's gone through a lot. We know that. I mean, we talked about that last right. season. She she got raped, and this season three is her going through the court case and trying on, to this continues. And sexual assault, rape, violence, beatings, trauma still does not give you the right to act like a complete fucking asshole to the people who love and support you. Okay. All right. Um, she has, not only that, the season three, she's going through harassment, you know, and her mm -hmm. bar burns down because a friend. And then the guy who is going uh, to, who goes on trial for what he did, jury's deadlocked. So he ends up getting released. Oh no, a rapist went free. Uh, <laughs> Who'd have thunk it in New Orleans of all places? Uh, yeah. So she went. She went through some stuff. Uh, you know that's mm -hmm. that's for sure. But there's a moment I think where uh, Antoine walks in, and uh, this is the point. This is at the point where Larry's taking care of the kids, and she mm -hmm. looks. She knows. See, here's the thing, because she knows what's going on is not right. And he, she asks Antoine, she's like, you know, are we right here because? None of the kids are with their parents. And right. he that's when Antoine's like, look, we're doing the best that we can. And, you know, there's something to be said for that. Granted, I, I would have, the bar should have stayed burned down, in my opinion. That's just me. But I think, obviously, the message behind this is culture. Listen, when you want what you New want, Orleans, it doesn't really matter if you're hurting your family. I'm not, I'm definitely <laughs> not going to support that argument in any way <laughs> i might be a little facetious <laughs> uh but yeah it, it, it was a rough go for her let's move on welcome to Unless passive got... aggressive. welcome to passive aggressive <laughs> cast well let's talk we're gonna have another relationship to talk about here Oi. In a second. oh yeah. no yo let's just fight this out right now you motherfucker <laughs> let's, just get uh... this, let's just get this done you me get in the ring Let's put the gloves on in the cups. Uh, ding, okay. ding. Set it up for me, Jesse. So, okay. The big question here is, did Davis deserve to be left like he was by Annie? Okay, the obvious so, answer to that is yes. Okay. All right. L let's talk this out here real quick because okay, let's talk it at, out. at the, at the point, at this point in time, when Annie is, Annie is off doing her own thing. She's gone to in search of superstardom, signing with a manager. Mm -hmm. Um, and the record. Yep. She's out of town and lo and behold, Mardi Gras happens. And she's like, well, wait a second. I've got to get back home because I want to spend Mardi Gras with Davis and, uh, you know, do all these fun things that I, I don't want to miss out. She comes home, Davis, who he's having a rough go. Okay. He's trying to get this rock opera or rock opera. He's trying yeah. to get this jazz opera uh, yeah. together, get all these people in on it. Um, and some things happen with his CD mm -hmm. uh, to where it doesn't get to the right places, but he's going through some stuff. Uh, he ends up becoming drunk and depressed. And at one point, you, you would think that she would have just given him the i don't know a shoulder to cry on okay. something along let me, those let lines me stop you there why was annie in new orleans i'll answer that for you annie was in new orleans to develop and pursue a music career which is what she was doing 
it has less to do with Davis and his depression and more of she had she was following her dream. I I don't I watched the same show as you do. I didn't think Annie did anything wrong. Just Annie if somebody, the- just if somebody comes to you and be like, listen. I understand Mark's going through a rough go of it, but we need you to like, you know, be super podcaster and go on tour. You should leave me the fuck right here. Go. <laughs> like, I, what yeah, are we talking but about? Then, are you going to be a little, uh, look, it, the thing, the thing, the problem, the problem that I had, and here's the thing, mm-hmm. it's, it's completely undone by what Davis does on Mardi Gras, but <laughs> she ends up like, as soon as she leaves, like one of the next scenes is her in bed with the manager. Like she sleeps with the manager shortly thereafter. Poor Davis. All he could do is find his, uh, you know, find his love uh, uh, in Jeanette there. So don't, don't, don't focus on that too much. Just whatever you do. <laughs> don't, don't look at the fact that he actually slept with her either. I, 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 I don't think know what that difference it fucking makes. Like uh, there, your whole there you argument go. to me when we were talking about this in chat was. Annie T should have been loyal to Davis, and I'm saying you're wrong. Her loyalty was to the music business. She was pursuing that to the exclusion of all else, but that was her character. Yeah. And I think she, she was not in New Orleans to find love and family. She was in New Orleans to find music stardom, and she did, and so she went. But her and Davis were such a great couple. Who I mean, gives a shit? I felt... S- all right. That's fine. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. I mean, I, I think that you wanted, what did you want Andy to do? Would you, would you, let, let me ask you a question, homeboy. Let me ask sure. you a question there, uh, family guy. You wanted Annie to give up her dreams so that she could stay home with Davis and make cookies and raise kids? No, I didn't expect her to stop what she was doing. What I expected her to do <clears throat> was like be like, cut Davis some slack. Don't break up with the she guy. She had to go Don't to fuck. She was going on tour. She broke up with him. Yeah, she shit break up with him. All right. I, I think that they should have worked this out. She should let have me, let me let me tell talk you to him. Let me tell you, Davis was holding her back. I truly oh, believe that. Okay. I, honestly, she had to. She was a a brighter star and a more talented artist than Davis could ever hope to be. As smart as he was about the music industry and history, she needed to drop Davis. Like, see, so here's the thing: Davis picked her up after Sonny like beat her and like left her in the fucking street, and he took care of her and he nurtured her, and she outgrew him, which happens. And, and a woman alive, in a woman alive, I'm gonna sit here and tell you that sometimes they don't outgrow their man. Mm-hmm. Andy T outgrew Davis. And then what happens? She ends up with the manager. She was really happy there towards the end, wasn't she? Let's see. Well, I don't you, know. The final scene of her in season four is her arguing with her manager. Because no, the she's final unhappy. scene is her doing is her doing fucking photos for her CD. They came uh, to remember. They came. To, she walked out of a recording session. Because they had done like auto tune and like Chris, you know, she sounded like fucking Chris Jericho from Posse, and um, and she's like, they have a drink in the bar, and she's like, I have to control the music. If I'm not doing the music that I love, then why am I doing this at all? He was like, That's great, but I'm I have to sell your music, and we got to this point because your shit don't sell. You you hit a ceiling where you'll sell in a very small region of the country, and that's all you're gonna do. And I thought you wanted to be, I thought you wanted to be Tori Amos or Natalie Merchant, not you know, regional singer gal. And sh- and what decision does she make? You're like, she's like, that's right. That is what I want. I want to be Tori Amos. I want to be Natalie Merchant. I want to be Amy Mann. All right. Let's be an adult about this. You have to make sacrifices in order to move forward and excel in this world. It would be nice if you could just have everything your way and do everything the way you want. And, the- and people throw flowers at you and riches and you sit on top of the mountaintop never having sacrificed a, even a little bit of yourself. But that is not reality. And her story is absolutely realistic to me. And her leaving Davis behind, who is just the picture of arrested development and immaturity, works for me. I was on Annie's side. All right, then. I could have swore during that montage, the last thing was her, or like one of the last things that you see is her in the recording studio and arguing with her manager some more. Um, I want the point I'm trying to make. Now. Is, we're arguing now. Sometimes the best content comes from consternation and, you know, antagonism. <laughs> Love just, you, buddy. I just want to say that she was happier with Davis and she should have tried to let that work long distance relationship or not. I think that she should have given him at least a, a little bit of, 
I don't know what of... is going on with you, but there is some projection or some shit going on here. I'm, Did some... Who hurt... I'm rooting for this guy. Are you shitting me? Who this fucking dude hurt ended up... you in a... Who hurt you in a former life? Here's the thing. Okay. Davis landed Annie, and that was awesome. And I felt so <laughs> happy for Davis because, you know, as he said, a, a I think somebody decent, said to him, a like, decent dude with a, with a 10 charisma landed a mostly hot chick. He, yes. Well, and what's funny is somebody pointed out, I think it was Nerds Jeanette, of the world looked at him, Jeanette looked at him and said, you are punching way out of your weight class. And he, <laughs> he was. Hey, not and, for nothing, but she, he also picked damaged fruit. She, she just got, she just took a whooping by fucking Sonny. Uh, yeah. Well, anyway. Her, 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 her ego may have been a little fragile. Uh, Can we talk about what an anyway, asshole Jeanette is also? Poor Jeanette. You know, she goes. Oh my to God. <laughs> she goes to New York. She comes back uh, after entering into a partnership with uh -huh. a guy who wooed her back to New Orleans so she could use her name. Stupid business decision. I'll give you that. But yeah, she can't use her name after she decides to quit this guy. Go ahead. What was you going to say? I just think Jeanette's an asshole. She was, to she was told, you control the food. I control everything else. She gets everything that... She Stop me if you think you've heard this one before. She gets everything that she wants, isn't satisfied, isn't happy, doesn't know what she wants, and quits. Who is the true villain of this podcast? It's you. <laughs> me? <laughs> Mark Rabbit? You. I am, you are what? the villain. <laughs> I, am a, I speak the truth, sir. <laughs> That's a fucking uh... asshole, man. I, I, I should be so lucky as to someone hand me you know, a partnership where I have complete creative control and they just handle the fucking money and maybe I don't act like a child. I will say that, you know, she, we start out, I think it was season, was it season two? She was working mm -hmm. for that chef that was just horrible. Yeah. And then what you, what you watch happen in season three is that she enters into this lucrative partnership with this guy and mm -hmm. then she turns in to the asshole chef. Yeah. Like she's yeah. yelling and screaming at and, She's fucking idiot sandwiching people. But what, what, <laughs> what's great <laughs> is that she realizes that it's not for her and she decides I'm walking away. I'm done. Of course, you know, there's a couple other run-ins that she has, um, but she finally separates from that guy. But yeah, you signed a contract kind of hard to get out of uh, the fact that your name's on my restaurant. I learned Therefore, this shit in high school, a contract is a contract is a contract. And if you don't want to be an adult and honor it, don't sign one. Oh, watching her like go through the HR motions mm -hmm. and sit there and go like, what? I can't just tell a guy he's fired. Right. Uh, and they're like, mm, no, you can't really. I have fucking been there. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't sympathize with Jeanette at all. Like, I watch uh, that and I'm just like, you dick. Well, she ends she up getting her name. She should have stayed at David Chang's. <laughs> David Chang's pretty cool. He seems go, pretty neat. Go, go make fancy food for fucking chefs and shut the fuck up, Jeanette. Oh, goodness. God forbid you'd be given an opportunity to rebuild your life and you fucking piss it out the window. Uh, she gets her name back. Ladies she and does. gentlemen, by the end because of John season four, because John Sato snookered Tim Feeney. Way to go, buddy! Way to go. Um, we got to talk about DJ Davis, though. DJ Davis, oh my goodness! I think his heart was in the right place with all, like the, the jazz opera thing. But here's the thing about he's a dreamer. You know, Davis is a dreamer. He he's a big thinker. He's got big ideas. But he like Mimi and the, the guy that the other guy that runs the label, the producer. Like they always have to ground him, and then like, and then like, kind of like Jeanette, he just those fucking tantrums, just oh. just big old baby man tantrums, and then <laughs> and quits the fucking music business on an and ongoing what, basis. That's uh, so great. Mm -hmm. Like the the dude, finally somebody's like, okay, somebody's got to break it to him. He can't do lead vocals because we've been seeing that since season one, right. but. Somebody finally is like, maybe he's like, we, he can't do lead vocals on this thing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he ends up throwing an absolute fit, throws on a bonus track of him, right. like just calling out all these people yeah. that he had worked with, <laughs> you know, all these mm -hmm. people. What was, what was his name? The rapper from Calio. the beginning. Uh, Cal Calio. Yeah, well, Calio. Um, he calls them all out on all this shit that's happened to him mm -hmm. and ends up going viral and becoming a successful. Right. And he uh, can't just be like, all right. I have shit in everyone's Cheerios. Good day. <laughs> He's I, so bad. And I'm quit. I'm done. I'm right. out of here. He can't just fucking walk away. He got a little taste of fame and notoriety from that. And it was like, I'm back in. Fuck Davis. <laughs> that was what I say. Oh, now we're back to fuck Davis. His heart's <laughs> in the right place, but fuck Davis. Well, I look, uh, I support his wanting to get musicians paid, but 
as Mimi pointed out to him, like, this is a fucking dumpster fire of cost and it's not going to work. And you're going to have to, like, we're running a business here. I get asked, like, why we do some of the animation stuff that we do, why we have some of the people on the Rattle and Broadcasting Network that we have. And I have to tell the people that ask me those things because I'm running a fucking business here. I put on what I think is going to get hit, which is going to draw viewers. And granted, we are like the smallest of small operations here. I am not saying like this is like, you know, Fox or anything. But everything is about downloads, views, whatever. And some stuff does naturally better than others. All of our animation stuff, because of the people that are on it and what they do to market it, draws. They will always have a spot on this network for that reason. This isn't, I'm not doing like art for art's sake. Yes, this is a hobby, but I will still like people to watch. I still want people to listen. And look, this does not do well. (laughs) What we're doing here, this is you and me once a month just jerking each other off. And I love it. (laughs) But I can afford to do that because my other shit does do fairly well. It draws an audience. So I have a little time left over to do stuff that's that I'm passionate about that no one gives a fuck about. And no one gives a fuck about the David Simon stuff. I'm sorry. But I care. And a few of our friends care. And that's good enough for me. But the money is in Cuphead. (laughs) You know? The money is in Spider-Man across the universe. The money is in this, you know, the shit that did, you know, thousands and thousands of fucking downloads. Like, the Metal Hammer of Doom used to do really, really well. I think Nightwish was probably <laughs> downloaded. The, the Nightwish re- pr- retrospective was downloaded like 300 times yesterday, probably. Yeah, something so like that. that. <laughs> it just continues and continues. You know, but like, you know, if Davis were here right now and he was hearing us talk about this, like, no, we have to do a podcast about underwater basket weaving. Like, no. <laughs> And all, business. And all, all the three founders that uh you know he, he could name right. off rattle them off real quickly right. uh well uh, just by the end of season four davis mm-hmm. has again. made a transition mm-hmm. he, he makes a transition he baptizes himself in the mississippi river and comes Actually, out as mr mcillary my favorite davis scene in the entire history of Treme, other than um sex machine was him selling wine at Jeanette's restaurant. Oh, when he comes in and he's like, he's got a suit on. Yeah. And yeah. And he's actually really good at it. Yeah. Like, I love that. I, I showed some growth and maturity, but then he undoes it all because it's like, once again, like I, oh my God, Martin Luther King and Godzilla. And he's off and running on another <laughs> stupid musical project. Yeah, right. All right. I'll tell Pete you fan. my favorite, my favorite Davis scene. Mm-hmm. Out of, I think it was season three is him finding out about the CDs not being, he gets a, mm-hmm. a CD shipment in, I think, or he gets the box. He gets he the catalog. And, he gets the catalog of all releases. And it's not in there. And he gets right. so pissed. He's like kicking things around. And I guarantee you, this could not have been scripted. He punches the box mm-hmm. and the box flies up, hits something, comes back and hits him in the face. And it's one of the greatest scenes. <laughs> yeah, that was was like, a, it, that, they, they got that shot. And they were like, cut, done. <laughs> nope, done. Move it on. <laughs> Steve's so like, do you want me to do it again? I can't ask you to do it again. It's perfect the way it is. No way. No other angle uh, needed. So, yeah, Steve, or I'm sorry, Davis and Jeanette find themselves in each other's arms again, yes. um, which, you know, hey, poor Jacques. That definitely, you know. Always he, the bride, Jacques, like, never the bride. <laughs> right. All right, moving on. Let's get into our law enforcement part of this show. We got the mm-hmm. civil rights uh, lawyer, Tony Burnett. Her daughter, Sophia, who uh, she was there in season three and then showed up for the last episode of season four. Yeah. And then we have a new character this season. Chris Coy as LP Everett, who is a reporter. Mm-hmm. I don't know out of if I don't know where he's out of like Seattle. Maybe I have no idea. But anyway, he shows up in Louisiana. He's doing New Orleans. He's doing some research on some uh, you know suspicious deaths and vigilante murders. Yes. OK, there we go. There we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, civil rights lawyer ain't stopping. Oh, uh, Tony, just, Tony, for those of you that are just like, I really just wanted to be this show to be like more like the wire. Well, here's your investigating. <laughs> here part. you go. Here's two here people you... running around trying to solve homicides. Yeah, I think, uh, in our, is it our first episode? I don't know if it's the first episode where Tony's, uh, like legal aid ends up watching an officer beat the crap out of a guy, yep, uh, at a bar. You and know what, that... you know what the best part of all this is. Him going Tell to the me. goat whore show. Goat oh. whore. Oh, man. Goat whore and I hate guys. Let me tell you the first time I, I watched Tremay, and he's just like, 
New Orleans has a dope fucking grindcore scene, and he's talking about goat whore and I hate God. I'm like, I know those pants. I know those pants. <laughs> <laughs> I was in there, man. I've seen. I went to uh, the House of Blues in New Orleans, and I saw Suffocation. I think Cattle Decapitation and a bunch of other like hardcore, like grindcore bands. Oh wow! Yeah. Well, if anything, we could say they've represented the music scene quite well. Yes, they did. So anyway, uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of season three is Tony trying to take on a couple cases obviously the abreu murder is still a thing she wants to try yep. and get that resolved and all these cases start you know you start to see that they're intertwined as there is some definite corruption yeah in the nolens pd we got officer wilson who she takes out an ad in a paper stating have you been beaten by this man or something along <laughs> those lines with a picture of his face or a picture of him in mm -hmm. his uniform and everything um so uh, you know she's there you go. I mean, that's most of what you get. And we get a solid resolution, I think, yep. by the end of... They, uh, arre they arrest the cop that shot Abreu and a few others. You know, his story gets printed in the nation. The FBI gets involved. They start cleaning house at NOPD. You know, it's like it's it's a happy ending to a sad story. Right. And that all kind of ties in with mm. Detective, or I should say, Coulson. Lieutenant Lieutenant Terry Colson here. Yeah. Who ends up getting a job at Homicide. And, of course, all the people that he work over... Uh, that he, that he works with know that he's talking to the FBI mm -hmm. and it just gets pretty unbearable for him where, I mean, they are clearly harassing, not only are they harassing Sophia and Tony, mm -hmm. but you know, he begins to uh, catch a lot of crap himself. Obviously, literally he actually has dog crap on his car at one point. Yep. And eventually, um, you know, he ends up testifying in court and you know, it, it resolves the way that it does. And, but then he's done. He turns in his papers and actually, I love the way he quits. He's just like, he goes to, you know, turn in his retirement papers and he hands over his badge and his gun and everything. And they're like, you have to take that over here. He's just like, fucking deal with it. I'm out. <laughs> yep. Only thing that was missing from that scene is for him to drop his pants and waddle out. <laughs> he ends up in a relationship with Tony. Tony finds out that he was talking to the FBI and that he was yeah, one of that the That he ones didn't that lose the evidence. He was trying to suss out who was lying to him. Yeah, she believed he was corrupt at one point, but then right. finds out that he wasn't. Uh, yeah, so the, they, FBI, they, the FBI had to fucking set her straight. <laughs> yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of my uh, my favorite moment for Colson, I guess there's two. There's the one where he says, hey, he talks to one of the, uh, he ends up getting his ass beat when he goes into uh, yeah. a house. And after the cop told him, yeah, I've got your back. We'll be around back. And nobody was there. So mm -hmm. he tells that cop, hey, meet me outside. I don't have my rank. And the guy shows up and he's like, hey, Lieutenant. And then he Way beats the sh shit out of that guy. Yeah, Colson, make, Colson don't take no mess. No, he does not. Set that guy straight because he knew. So, and the other great moment is you know, as we reach the end of the series, mm -hmm. Colson has decided to move to Indianapolis. He's done being a cop. He's he's leaving Tony. And I'm, I'm you know, that's all very hard. But one of the things that's really you know kind of sets in for him is as he's leaving. And the Mardi Gras theme or whatever it is that they always play during mm -hmm. Mardi Gras, Tony, Tony plays is playing over the radio and he's getting just outside of New Orleans and that station is fading out. And he has to turn the radio off because the static is overtaking what that song is. And it's just a great way of kind of showing you, you know, he has he's leaving New Orleans and, and, and his life that he had there is now left behind. So sad moment, but it was really poignant. So I, I think like it that. also says a lot about like family. You know, like he has a speech when he's sitting at the table with his ex-wife and her new husband and the boys where he's like, you're not your job. You're not your career. I'm not Terry the cop. I'm just Terry. Mm -hmm. And I think we get caught up in our, our, our dreams and careers and ambitions. And we sometimes we lose sight of what's really important. And what's really important is your family. And he figured that out towards the end. And that's where he went. And I was, you know, I like the ending with Colson. Yeah, same here. Same here. I was waiting, by the way, I was waiting for LP Everett to end up dead at some point during yeah. the season. I was like, he's <laughs> no going to die at some point. He the doesn't. Greeks are going to put a fucking bullet in his head. <laughs> All right. Oh, we have and to talk about, on. we have to talk about Desiree because she becomes Desiree. an actual character. Yep. She, she graduates to actual character in season three. Right, right. She's not just, Antoine, you need to take care of your baby, Antoine. You can't be fucking girls on Mardi Gras, Antoine. Antoine, we need to get out of this apartment, Antoine. 
So can you set up? I mean, I understand a little bit about what's going on here with the whole yeah the uh, federal Noah money, thing. Yeah, federal yeah. money was being distributed to contractors in New Orleans to either remediate, repair, fix up homes, or demolish them. And they were demolishing homes that people had not given consent to was part of the issue. Mm. Mm-hmm. And where it involves her, where her paths on across because she starts to notice this happening around town, and she's like, "What the fuck?" Because here's the thing: this is an under, this is like the undercurrent of a bigger issue, which is gentrification reform, Lamar. Reform, um, Lamar. Reform. They knock out the poor, get rid of the poor blacks, build a giant hospital. Get rid of the poor blacks, build a giant jazz center. You know, people like a big thing that that Treme deals with is how. There's always been, according to the show, there's always been this desire to wash out the poor on wash masses and bring in people with money. You know, we want to we want to give this city a facelift. And part of, you know, Davis is um, going back to him for a second. Davis's whole thing about like the musical heritage tours and like everything is like a burnt out husk of a building where, you know, where, where culture once stood. And, you know, <laughs> it's like, like, why? Why does nothing exist in this city? And he was like, we, when his line about we preserve through neglect, you know, yeah, uh, other, yeah. Other cities just tear it down and build a parking lot. We just let it rot and let mm-hmm. it sit there untouched. Yep. And I kind of like, and I kind of like that. But, you know, the whole thing is, is like, okay, well, no, we're done with this. We're, let's get rid of the blight. Let's get rid of these homes that are filled with mold and shit. And let's get rid of the people while we're at it. Because that's the other thing that Desiree is pointing out. It's like, hey, people went to Atlanta and Houston and all these other places, and they're wanting to come back, but they're waiting for their federal money to repair their fucking homes and, like, you know, get the mold out, build, put the walls back, and they can't. And then their homes get demolished. Mm-hmm. Like, it's really fucked up. And they chose, I think, a good character to sort of put that on it as your as your as your window character. Don't they go in and like remediate her home and then turn around and she gets a call and her she mother's shows home. up? That's her mother's they, home. They, yeah, that's right. Yeah. They like remediate and then demolish. And like how you end up on the same two, two different lists. <laughs> what the hell yeah. is going on? Right. So yeah, she actually has this arc where she gets heavily involved in that. Right. Uh to try and figure out uh, number one, what's going on and get these get this situation fixed. And it's great that you know how how much, and I think this was even mentioned in the article. Mm-hmm. But how much I thought Nelson, which we could talk about him here in a second, but um, how much I thought Nelson was going to be the villain of this show. Turns out he's he was, like a decent dude. Yeah, he's a decent guy. They show up at his office and they like just read him the riot act about what's going on. And he's mm-hmm. like, you know what? I'm not in that business anymore. I'm done as of right now. And I was like, right. oh, OK, which I, I don't think he was because I think he started. No, he turns to his partner. And- he's just like, <laughs> We're, we are done we were done anyway like just (laughs) yeah right (laughs) uh but yeah she actually has an arc and there is a moment and i'll I'll talk about and we'll talk we can talk about antoine here in a second but Mm -hmm. the moment that desiree actually uh, there was some growth in in the relationship between her and antoine and as she's doing this um i think we see growth in antoine too because he starts to realize that she, he starts to respect her. I think a lot of what we get prior to this season, just like us, we're like, oh, here she is, Antoine, Antoine, get a mm-hmm. job, Antoine. And I'm like, oh my gosh, can she stop being the nagging girlfriend for a second? The nagging right. wife. Well, she's a na- girlfriend. I don't think they're married. Because remember when she was all excited that he's giving her a ring <laughs> and mm-hmm. it wasn't a ring. But anyway, well, um, I think he's like a broad, he, you know, it's a broad, he knocked up. And now he's got yeah. to attend to this baby. So he's got to deal with this. You know, she was probably fine for, you know, a fuck in the bathroom after a gig. But like, oof, she ain't the Marion type. And like over the course of three and a half seasons, he's like, OK, we actually have like a real relationship here. Right. We have a he child begins- together. And like Antoine's whole much like Colson, Antoine realizes that family and giving back is worth more than just being a vagabond musician. Right. Right. So, yeah, I think her going off and doing these things Mm -hmm. gained his respect. And that obviously he he was able to begin to respect her more, which definitely improved their relationship a little bit. So let's go ahead and talk about Antoine then. Mm -hmm. Uh, Antoine Batiste. I know uh, I think 
uh, was it at the it was at the end of last season. He is, or maybe it's the beginning of the season. I can't remember. But he becomes the band uh, director. Yeah, the uh, uh, the, high, the the teacher moved, the main teacher goes to high school. Right. So a lot of a lot of what he is doing is he is having to try and adjust to this. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, having style. having a wife that's been a teacher for the length and breadth of our marriage, and kind of hearing about the limitations and lack of resources for needy kids. Like I, I, I could hear my wife coming out of Antoine's mouth. Like, you know, he discovers that one of the students can't fucking read worth a lick. Yeah. And he's like, okay, well, what are we going to do about it? And the answer is, well, nothing. Like there's nothing that we can do it is what it is. Hmm. And like, there's a lot of, you know, it's so funny because he talks about like, I just wanted to be a band leader. It turns out I'm a parent. Yeah. And that is a very real teacher thing. Like you are these kids, parents from the time they get to school to the time they go home. And it's the worst parenting job because here's the thing. We are home with our kids. Well, you are. I my life is fucked up. But um, we I was <laughs> <laughs> um, you. I was once home with my children, and right. um, and the 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 rules and the values and the things that we put in place with them stay with them because we're with them. You as a teacher can do all of those things, but once they leave you, they go back to their shit homes. Where those things aren't followed up on and followed through on, and they just go away. And all you have left is the little the couple hours a day that your teacher's working with you. Mm -hmm. And so it's like your parent, you're it's like you have all the worst parts of parenting with none of the good parts, including the ability to follow through on these things. And I can't tell you how like important it is in parenting to have that follow through. Yeah. Yeah. And then one of your kids gets a clap. You yeah. gotta take them to the <laughs> from one of them round away girls. <laughs> you know how uh, we do. <laughs> uh, that was that was a great scene where mm -hmm. the kid has to tell him, and he takes mm -hmm. him to the clinic, and he sees Sonny, mm -hmm. and he's like, ah, he's like the boy, he's starting early, isn't he? He's like, yeah, he's starting early, and the kid starts mm -hmm. laughing. He's like, shut up, man. <laughs> uh, that's good stuff. Mm -hmm. Um let's see what else happened with, with Antoine. I mean, he's, there's a, there's a point, especially at the end uh, in season four, where mm -hmm. he, he's so upset with the whole schooling. They system, cut it. They fact. cut his after school program. Right. And he has a great line about that. He was like, you don't mean to tell, you mean to tell me it's more of a liability to let these kids run on the fucking street than to have them here at the school. And they're like, well, technically, yes, they're in the street. They are, they're not a liability to us. And it's That's so sad. fucked up. It really is. It really is. It really, really is. Yeah. Yeah. He, you know, he's trying to help these kids out. One of the, mm -hmm. one of the kids, her boyfriend gets shot and yeah. then she ends up shot. I mean, that emotionally wrecks him, mm -hmm. uh, gives us an opportunity to see him and Colson <sighs> talk for a few seconds. Well, I love the band, the, the high school band leaders fucking thing about, I just watched my best snare drummer get sent to Angola for eight years. You know, I, yeah. I watched this young kid's life get completely wrecked. It's yeah. it's at that, and it's right at that point where he mentions gigging and the guy's like, you missed that, huh? And then the next, like that day, mm -hmm. I think he does a gig that night and then another gig that yeah. same night. And then he goes and does a second line and he's walking mm -hmm. out of the club in the morning. I mean, it's just like he goes and you're wondering, like, what is he trying to prove? Um, and and he I just, think he needed to get his like last licks in. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's it, it's clear that he's trying to see if that's going to be the life. And if right. not, he, he's, he's taking, he's doing everything he can with it right now. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, it, it, he definitely at, at the end of this, you know, he gets the kids back. He talks to Desiree and the kids are going to be uh, living at his house. Um, and I imagine LaDonna's part, they're probably going to be sharing custody. So, uh, but yeah, he had a, he had a fairly interesting arc, but ma mainly most of it is like, just watching him uh, try to deal with the school system. And so, yep. All right. Next up. I mean, uh, yeah. we, got, <laughs> uh, we got Sonny, the recovering drug addict who ends up essentially his whole arc is he's clean. The slow, he starts... the slow crawl of wooing this woman from her Japanese family. Yeah. I, Vietnamese. Ugh. So I, this is, Hong Chow as Lin, which, mm -hmm. by the way, she is a I think she was uh, part of a movie called The Whale. OK. And I don't know. if um, Also, The Menu. 
Oh so, yeah, yeah. So she's she's actually this is probably some early appearances for her, I guess. Sure. Um, she, she got some nominated for some stuff there for the whale, I believe. And anyway, uh, so she's, she's I put her on here just because of the name. Really, she doesn't have a whole lot of scenes or anything like that. But clearly, Sonny's trying to to woo her and her family, and he has to deal with her dad, which is kind of funny sometimes because <laughs> he's got. I mean, it's a whole talk about culture. You know, this is a whole other culture here in New Orleans that he's got to try and. Uh, try and get used to. Um, he relapses, mm -hmm. and but he realizes that he the he really loves Lynn, and of course he apologizes to her dad, and then ends up marrying her at the end of season three, but and then season four. Really, I mean, the only kind of two things that you see is like he's in the jail cell when the guy dies from the asthma attack, mm -hmm. and then I think he shows up in in the last episode in the audience, and Annie kind of points him out. Mm -hmm. uh saying oh you know he was he was the one that got me down here and he I, beat me <laughs> did he did he actually beat her did he, he hit slapped her? her one time okay i didn't i i can't remember that for some reason slapped but anyway poor you know sunny he's doing good folks yeah sunny's I, okay it was like these were like i never like necessarily fast forwarded through them but i was like always like deeply disinterested in sunny's story <laughs> he's an oyster well shrimpman i think now no oysters oysters is he, he was on is, he, is, he, is he still doing oysters okay who the fuck cares yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right and hey we got nelson hidalgo yep here Can just trying to get some shit him? built man he's just trying to get some shit built i get a jazz center belt a hospital belt you know he's trying to make moves make some shit happen but I tell you, like my my favorite thing about this is he's he you know, slowly but surely acquires all this real estate, and then he sells it so that they can build their hospital and their jazz center, and he gets like this ridiculous payout. It's like okay, well done, right. slow clap. <laughs> but he got you that, he got you that her name back. You know he's a good dude, right? Like, I think a lot of what his arc is is like again he's kind of like the outsider, like me. You know, the guy who's never been outside. Well, you know, of the state I was of thinking Ohio. about you. I was I, when he's telling the story about his cousin, and you like you had to bring that up. And that I think it was season one or season two. It's like, do you actually? It was season two. <coughs> he's like, do you actually build anything? Like, what do you? Yeah, do? that comes up again. Yeah, he that tells comes up story. again. Like he like yeah. he heard you, and he tells the fucking story. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that it, it it's poignant because I was just like, what does this guy do? And you really, you don't see much other than him just driving around and talking to people and making deals, apparently. Right. But what you know whatever but it, it's great that he brings that up when he gets her name back because he feels that mm -hmm. that is actually something that he did and yeah. he wants her to just stencil his name in there at the bottom and tiny print and when she puts her sign up with her name on it um but yeah i mean i think a lot of what i learned uh, if through him is like he's kind of like the outsider again just loving this town, loving the culture. Yeah. I liked watching him interact with Davis and him try to get a job, get D Davis a job at the jazz center. And Davis, of course, fucks it all up because he realizes he's talking like one of the biggest bankers, uh, Republican bankers or whatever. And he's, he's like, I do not want to work for this guy. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, Nelson's Nelson. He went around, got some stuff done. So, uh, you know, there was a point, I wrote this down here. There was a point in here where, I think it was Tony who looked at Sophia and said, do you remember what your dad used to say about the state of Ohio? As she was trying to figure out what college to pick. And I was like, right. what the fuck did John Goodman say about Ohio? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I take umbrage of this. Uh, but yeah, that's it, man. That's all the characters. We've done it, man. We did four seasons of Treme. Three and a oh, half, as you would I say. I want to, before we get out, um, let's talk about, you know, we talked about like this wasn't like the world's most Wazooie show. I mean, it's got some awards. In 2011, it won an Eddie Award for Best Edited One Hour Series for Non-Commercial Television. Um, it got nominated for Grammys in 2011. Didn't win, but it got nominated. Uh, Steve Earl got nominated for This City. This city will never drown. Um, it won two double. It won two double A bleh, NAACP award, Image Awards. Um, in 2012, it won for Outstanding Directing in a Dramatic Series. Uh, for Ernest Dickerson and the episode is Do What You Wanna. And then Outstanding Writing in a Dramatic Series for um, Santa Claus, Do You Ever Get the Blues? It was nominated for a bunch more. I'm just reading the ones that it won. Um, Candy Alexander won a... Hello. Um... <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's okay. 
Candy Alexander won Best Performance Drama in 2011 um, at the Natick Vision Awards. Again, nominated by shit tons. It won a Peabody, the George Foster Peabody Award in 2011. Um, and then it won a Primetime Emmy for Outstanding Sound Mixing for a miniseries for a movie. Kind of like what we said about <laughs> Wu-Tang Clan. Not at all surprising. Mm-hmm. For Sunset on Louisiana. And... Um, it was nominated for, in 2010, it was nominated for it, but it did not win. Outstanding directing for a drama series. These are all primetime Emmys. Outstanding original music and lyrics. In 2014, it was nominated for outstanding casting for a miniseries. Outstanding miniseries. Outstanding, it won for sound mixing. And outstanding writing. And won, it was nominated for, in 2011, for a satellite award for best drama series. And Wendell Pierce for best actor in a drama series. And then it was nominated uh, in in 2011 for the Writers Guild of America Award for Best New Series. So that is Treme. Um, I did I did want to say I was just going to say we we finished this series out with that pothole, <laughs> and uh, you know that that's what we open things up with. by the end of it. <laughs> by the end of it, but it, there's a statement there, and mm-hmm. I, I think a lot of it because it comes up I, I think a couple times in season four. Uh, obviously at the beginning of season four. And then I think there's a point where there's a truck that comes by and the, these people that are walking, I think it's Annie and her bandmate that are walking by mm-hmm. and the, these guys get out of the truck and you're thinking, Oh, they're going to fix the pothole. Even the guy walking with her said, I thought they were going to fix the pothole. They run in and get a case of beer and leave. <laughs> and so you mentioned it about how people of that town just, they honor the culture and what came before by letting things rot and that pothole and everything that's there on top of the pothole, a pothole and it's decorated. I mean, there's a statement there of how no matter the state of disrepair, the city is in, there's no deterrent to celebrating something. Yeah, And that's, you know, that's what I took from this show. And I think that was a great image to kind of send the season, send the series off on. I have to say, you know, after five seasons of The Wire and how depressing that is and the mental breakdown I had watching The Corner, like this is the most like positive, most like uplifting series finale of anything we've talked about with David Simon yet. Not that that was a high bar to clear Um, because everything's fucking like maddeningly depressing. (laughs) It really is. Yeah, it really if you, is. If you didn't want Homic- to kill yourself by the end of the corner, um, <laughs> homicide. The I think it was homicide. The movie G is like dead, and he's yeah. like you know he's talking to everybody that died mm-hmm. before. Yeah, you're right. This is probably the most uplifting, positive right. end. I mean, I mean, Generation Kill like it ends the way that it ends. It's like it's not nearly as depressing as the corner or the wire, but like, David, like a staple of the David Simon experience is to let you know that wherever. Your story takes place, whether it's the corners of Baltimore to the sands of Af- Iraq to the Treme where the people sashay, life goes on. There's no finality to it. We're just done telling this story for now, which I kind of like. But this one, there's more hope in the finale of Tr- Treme than anything else we've seen in David Simon thus far. Like, it's refreshingly hopeful. This city will never drown. And I really love that as kind of like a final statement about Treme. The second go around for me was much more enjoyable than the first. Um, I've, I've really fallen in love with the culture. I was actually telling my one of my girlfriends tonight. One of my girlfriends. Um, I'm fancy. Um, <laughs> I can't. I can't one of my, out of them. I, yeah. Um, <laughs> that when life gets hard, when 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 feel when things just feel so far out of reach, and I'm kind of lost the reins of everything. Whenever I my like, I just want to like go to the woods to live deliberately. The woods is actually like Treme. The words is New Orleans. I you know when I think about it's too hard to to live the life that I'm living, and I just want to escape. This is where I want to go. So having fallen in love with the city, having fallen in love with the culture and rewatching this show divorced from the expectations of the wire. I really enjoyed it this time around. I don't recommend this show lightly to people. This is a chore to get through. If you, as I said at the top and we've been saying it, if you can't handle sort of a meandering tale 
and you aren't into a jazz concert every five minutes and the culture of New Orleans, you are going to fucking hate this show, Game of Thrones. It is not. However, if you're up for, if you're interested in the New Orleans culture, the Mardi Gras Indians, the cuisine, the music, if you're into the idea of what, what happens when Mother Nature flattens your city, how do you how do you bounce back? Treme is worth a watch. Otherwise, probably skippable. Jesse, your thoughts? I'll agree. Uh, there's definitely some times where I found myself in the first season like this is really, really tough to get through. <laughs> and I didn't think I was going to like this show. Mm -hmm. So I am pleased to say that my attitude towards this has changed because I think there's a lot to be said here. And especially if you were somebody that's never been to New Orleans, never been outside the state of Ohio, mm -hmm. you didn't know what a second line was. You didn't know why in the world do they continually party all the time down there. This is a, probably something that will help you understand what that atmosphere is like and why they do what they do and, and the culture and the, the pride. Pride's a great word to kind of express what is uh, what is essentially down there in Treme. They have a pride of where they came up from, what their city was and what their city is. Uh, so I learned a lot watching this show. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciated the music. I may have fast forward through a good bit of it, but I understand what they're trying to get across here. It's it's. It is essentially, if you wanted to do a show that was essentially New Orleans, here you go. This is it. Yep. Can't can't say that. I can't say that about any other show. So there you go. <laughs> All right. And that closes the book on Treme, but we are not done. We are still making our journey, Jesse, hand in hand, one hand on each other's penises no. as we walk through the periwinkles. <laughs> this is a really strange, awkward <laughs> hand placement, holding hands and penises, and that's crazy. It's because we love each other. Um, <laughs> we are going to take the month of July off, and we are going to come back August 14th with Show Me a Hero. Hey, Jesse, I understand you like politics, politics, politics. Oh, no. Yeah, I, I, I hear you're into the finer oh, points boy. of housing development and race relations. Oh, man. Jesse is now regretting all of his life choices i wondered what this series was about i hadn't i've never heard of it show me a hero well jesse let me tell you show me a hero is a 2015 american miniseries based on the 1999 nonfiction book of the same name by new york times writer lisa belkin about yonkers bear 87 89 uh i'm gonna pronounce this wrong nick washisco like the book the miniseries details a white middle class neighborhoods resistant to a federally mandated scattered site public housing development in Yonkers, New York, and how the tension of the situation affected the city as a whole. Let me tell you something. Everybody <laughs> out there. Me, Gene. No. Let me tell you something, brother. Uh, so, no, I want to I address the audience because Mark Radlich already knows this, but Mark Radlich bought me a book. He's bought me actually a few books uh, in the past, but the first book I believe this man ever bought me was a book that was about eight miles thick called <laughs> The Power Broker. All right. I that is sounds like what we're getting into here is there's real estate going on, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of like development and stuff. Mark Radlich. For Mama. <laughs> the power broker. Ah uh, well, I can't mm -hmm. wait. Hey, listen. If you can get through one one season, one mini season, six 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 episodes, Jesse. It's only six episodes. I'm not six scared episodes. of six episodes. Six I'm, episodes. Look, yeah. this is a this is a little finger in the butthole. Okay, it's a little tickle, a little <laughs> little pink little pinky in your butthole. Okay, it's not the full fist. <laughs> Woo! <Woo-hoo! laughs> okay, it's just a little tickle. Just look, let it happen. Oh okay? boy, we're not oh, going we're not going full anal thrust here. It's just a little tickle oh, in the butthole. Man. Let it happen. Relax, because when you're done, right. Full on sloppy below job. Three seasons oh. of the fucking deuce, yo. The oh deuce. my goodness. Feminist my goodness. Pornography. Oh boy. Well, yeah. Well, that's gonna be a swing, isn't it? Yeah, it's gonna swing Going all right. <laughs> <laughs> Going from one thing to the other. 
Yep. So if you can get through a little, if you and your apolitical, I don't want to confront nobody self, then get through six episodes of Show Me a Hero, you get rewarded with three seasons of The Deuce. All right. Feminist pornography, Jesse. The Fantastic. rise of the porno industry. Oh, wow. That, that will be interesting. It was. James Franco plays twins. The- <laughs> <laughs> that's not a joke that is real shit. we he can't plays... find twins that's all i assume <laughs> so we just had james franco play him just play tw- fucking twins it's great <laughs> maggie gillenhall's in there you can see Mal- maggie gillenhall and they- i know i know that behind that black curtain behind you there is naked pictures of maggie gillenhall <laughs> minnie doesn't know but i know yeah so you can see Ooh. all her nakedness and her hoariness in the deuce oh, and then we finally funny. And then we finally will end our trip from the corner to the deuce with the plot against America, which I've never seen. So, hmm. David Simon show that I haven't seen. Could you imagine? I can't imagine that. I wonder what we're going to get into there. That's a good ways down the road, though. Shoot. We're talking yeah, what, five months, four or five months, five, five months. Yeah. Yep. All right. So we're back in August for uh, Show Me a Hero. And Jesse's going to show you his wiener in pictures. <laughs> show me where you piss from. <laughs> That's right. All right, speaking of showing me where you pissed from, tomorrow, I love you tomorrow, we are going to be talking Transformers, Rise of the Beast Wars. That'll be myself, David Wright, Robert Winfrey, and the Protocol son, Jason Teasley. And uh, because Jason got a new job, <coughs> we will not be doing Lake Placid this week. So, Aw, bummer. Yeah. However, next week... Um, We've got a, uh, we're, we're back to doing our queer cinema review. This is uh, the cinema that makes the LGBTQ community look not so great. Boys Don't Cry, which is my often my euphemism for when bad things happen. Oh, that got Boys Don't Cry, which if you know what happens in Boys Don't Cry, like rattle it, that's a bit much. For those of you that don't know, <laughs> you'll find out. Me. Um, I've never seen this. I've never seen the movie. All oh, right, watch then. Boys Don't Cry with your kids. It's great. It's a good family oh. movie. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I've stopped listening to you a long time ago. <laughs> a long time ago. Hey, Google pinball scene in Boys Don't Cry and get back to me, okay? Ooh, and try not I... to call me a fuckface when you do. Um, <laughs> Ed Wood and Gia. Uh, so that's next Monday. And then um, because I'm, <laughs> I'm passive aggressive and oppositional defiant, even though The Flash comes out the same time as Elemental... And I really should be reviewing The Flash first. We're going to review Elemental first because it originally was coming out before The Flash. And I don't want to switch it now. Fuck the movie industry. I threw a big, Speaking of throwing Davis-level man tantrums, my I threw a big-ass tantrum. It was like, I'm not switching my movie schedule. Fuck these people. And I'm going to wait two weeks to review The Flash after everyone seen it and no longer cares. <laughs> Maybe I'll air a Flash source material about a month later. <sighs> You know, back when I, before I was social, synergy. My, back synergy, synergy, back before my life was social and ruined, we were going to do the fastest man alive, but I took it off the schedule because who the fuck has time? Who the fuck has time? Jesse. Was that a comic? Yes. It was a, it was a flash comic. <laughs> uh, the fastest I, love, man alive. I love asking questions that you and I already know the answer to. No, I'm about. Don't know how. <laughs> Don't know how. Not on that dirty ground. Not on nope. that dirty ground. Nope. My big Indian oh, red. An man. hour later. My I... big Indian red. Five hours later. <laughs> oh, 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 nation. Oh, 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 nation. My big uh, Indian red. Twelve hours later. My big. <laughs> still going. Listen, <laughs> was those when those chiefs met each other in the street and started dropping bars on each other? I was like, <laughs> were they, were oh, they were fucking yeah. doing like battle raps as Indian <laughs> as Indians? I get it now. I get oh, it. It's so good. <laughs> I, I, I shoot the lightning. I put, like, what? <laughs> That's a, oh my god! Every time the. You ever see like kids fucking like play like playing cowboys and Indians or whatever? It was like that. It was you know. Oh yeah. I I, def- I wanted one of the Indians to be like, I have a force field. <laughs> your big, your big <laughs> can't, can't the force field. On top, but don't know how. Flag boy just, just threw a mountain at you. Dropped it on top of your head. Uh, Flag so, boy. Flag boy said, "My ray gun defeats your all, <laughs> your force field." Yeah. Also uh, pretty. I, I mean, oh jeez. Anyway, 
Let's see. <laughs> back, back to the schedule. Back to, back to the plugs. Nah. <laughs> we should oh, get, shit. Next episode, we, we need to like write this out ahead of time and just go fucking full Mardi Gras Indian on each other. <laughs> <laughs> I write the schedule. Um, I'll do the podcast. Uh, I, I read the comic books. I don't do podcasts. <laughs> I don't know what that is. We, uh, just, we played a stack. <laughs> Colton comes stay down. Out. He wants a stack. Stay in your own decade. I'm all in the 90s. Mark talks about the poly. We should shut the fuck up. <laughs> oh my God. Take your poly and shove it up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> Tell your wife to stay home. <laughs> oh man. I'm fucking crying over here, dude. Oh, shit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, damn. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Mardi Gras right. Indians has to be its own podcast. Fucking Andrew Graham sitting out there like, oh, man, I can't. I cannot. No, not that's listen whole, to this shit anymore. That's a whole fucking TikTok series right there. It's just me and you speaking Mardi Gras Indian at each other. Oh, Because he's not He read the comic books. What are you talking about? <laughs> Uh, all right. What else is on the schedule? <laughs> I'm I'm good, man. <laughs> you go ahead and all right. read it. Oh Dizzy Sartre, plug your comics. I can't see. I can't see <laughs> shit. Dizzy Sartre, uh, he, he reads a comic from the '90s. Look at his shoes. That's right. Everyone's that is right. Pouches. Lots of pouches. Uh, lots of them. Lots of pouches. Listen, you, you. First off, if you're listening to this right now, go and check out the source you're material. To this, comics you turn feed. this off and walk the fuck away. <laughs> we appreciate you. We really, yeah. really do. Uh, Mark and I actually got together and talked War or Gasmageddon on the latest Source Material Comics podcast. It's a quick 20, hey, almost, it was 21 minutes and 57 seconds. <laughs> That's how close I got it to 22. But uh, you can go check that out. Uh, we had a good time talking about that comic. It was a quick hit, but man, what a funny book. What was a mm -hmm. funny, funny book. Yeah, had a good time with that. And, yes, yes. Next week should be uh, myself, Evan Bevins. Chris Armstrong getting together talking about the Ultraverse. You may not know much about the Ultraverse. If you were reading comics in the 90s, by golly, you might. But uh, we did the Ultraverse launch titles. So that was Prime, Strangers, and probably getting those wrong. I can't remember. But check it out. That's going to be airing next Monday. And I think that is it for me. All right, folks. Thank you for joining us here on TV Party tonight as we transverse from the corner to the deuce. That there, Jesse Sorter, he fought the fire. Coochie fire. Coochie fire. Coochie man. <laughs> Coochie man. I am the Coochie man. That's, uh, that's my name at the treehouse. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> be well, be safe. <laughs> <laughs> I need he can't finish it. Oh, man. <laughs> be well, be safe, and Coochie man. <laughs>